Hey guys, this is Amanda. And this is Matt. And uh, we wanted to make a uh, video to share with you some of the latest and greatest in proposed tax changes that was released recently from the House Ways and Means Committee. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of interesting details in there, some of which are great, some of them may, may not be that great, but uh, definitely still important to uh, take a look at and uh, follow along to see kind of how things play out. This was actually a headline from, I think, uh, yesterday um, that we can read through. That basically, this is from Accounting Today, uh, with some, you know, publications for a lot of you know, CPAs and accountants, that says, the biggest tax increase in a generation took a major step forward by the House Ways and Means Committee for $2.1 trillion in new levies, mostly focused on corporations and the wealthy. This is the biggest tax increase in a generation. Well, President Trump passed a couple of things like four years ago where they said it was the biggest changes in, in a generation. And so if this continues happening every couple of years, you can see why we, uh, we're, we're going to be have great job security. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I think a lot of people who read this and say, oh, yeah, it's focused. The increases for the corporations, right? We're thinking large corporations, which we don't care about. That's not us. Um, and then levies on the wealthy, which is not us, right? Well, who are the wealthy? You know, it's probably like the billionaires and millionaires. Uh, but we'll, we'll take a look at that as we go through uh, these next few slides to really look at what are the details and what are the definitions. And we, you know, the funny thing is we've been waiting for months, right? I mean, mm -hmm. President Biden talked about this leading up to the election. And then every month of this year, they kind of, kind of, you know, tease it a little bit. When are we going to pass? When are they going to change it? We're like, we're waiting, we're waiting. We're not sure when it's going to pass. And so, they, the, you know, the other day when they passed, we came out with this information, it was the most detailed information we've gotten to this to this point uh and it kind of points the fingers of where they're trying to go and again nothing's passed so you know things can change but this is the proposals that they're talking about at least sort of like christmas morning here in the tax world you know getting to open the presents except they're not presents they're more like ticking time bombs that we're opening but yeah i wouldn't describe this as christmas morning <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is nothing new right biden's policy proposal calls for tax increases for those with income over 400,000, we've been hearing about this for months and months, maybe over a year. And um, so the question becomes, you know, uh, you know, 400,000, if I make less than 400,000, am I safe, right? I'm going to get tax cuts, my tax is not going to be increased. And so one of the important things is to look into what was recently released and kind of get a definition of what is what is truly wealthy. Uh, going forward. And so on the next slide, you'll see the new definition of wealthy, right, as, the, as it appears to, to be, is for single uh, taxpayers making 400000 For married, though, it's not double that. It's not 800000 Rather, it's- That would be too easy. That would be too simple. Yeah. Rather, it's <laughs> 450 for married filing joint. So, uh, you know, pretty severe marriage penalty, Right. And so if you can see, like if, um, you know, if it's a, a married couple, right, someone could be making just over 200,000 and be considered super wealthy if each of you are making over 200 or something. Right. So um, don't just tune out because you by yourself don't make 400. Because you just realize that you're wealthy. <laughs> we, just, wealthy we just right? told you that you're you're one of the uber wealthy people now. Right. Yeah. All right, so now let's go. So, so keeping that in mind, okay, it's really important that 400,000 single, 450 married mark because we'll be talking about that quite a bit um, today. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the first things that jumps out from the proposals are looking at increasing the top tax bracket. This is important to real estate investors because you know rental income, commissions income, management fee income, all those kind of different incomes are all taxed at ordinary rates. And even interest income, if you're a note investor, that's going to be taxed at ordinary rates. So you throw on this W-2, that's tax at ordinary rates as well. So, you know, married couples, that high, highest tax rate can kick in when, when each person just making $225,000 theoretically, right? So they're basically going to raise it. They're wanting to raise it at the top rate from 37% to 39.6% for those people have with, you know, single people with taxable income over 400,000 or married couples with taxable income over 450. So 37 to 39.6%. You know, obviously, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, you know, two and a half percent, essentially. But keep in mind that 37 percent right now for 2021 doesn't kick in for a married couple until 
uh, substantially over six hundred thousand dollars of of taxable income. So they're dropping the threshold for when the top rate kicks in. So that's the big change there. So too. more people will be paying this high. This, not only the, are the taxes going up, but more people will right. be paying the higher tax rate. And we're just getting started, guys. This is the first bullet point. <laughs> all right. I can next see people one. people just cracked all their alcohol just to start. <laughs> Taking this in, right? All right. And the next one, uh, capital gains increase. So, uh, for, you know, for the past couple of months, we've been hearing capital gains for high uh, for high income earners are going to go up to um, 39.6%. So this is a little bit of a good news is that in the current proposal, it's going from 20% to 25%. Okay. So still, you know, bad in that it's going up, but not as bad as what we were originally seeing or hearing. Uh, so, so that's, a, you know, a little bit of a relief, although it is still going up. One of the weirdest things that we noted in, in looking at, you know, the most recently released detail is that this capital gains increase is supposed to kick in for gains that you realize after September 13th, 2021. So theoretically, yes, shake your head, say what? So you could have sold some stocks or crypto, you know, yesterday for a huge gain and be subject to a higher tax rate. Um, but last week you would have been, you know, you would have had the previous one, right? Yeah. So this is something interesting. I mean, and obviously you can see it'll create nightmares for taxpayers as well as CPAs in general, right? To have to figure out a, a change in tax rate mid-year. Um, so we're hoping, keeping our fingers crossed that they'll make it, you know, just pro uh, going to go forward basis to 2022. But currently this is, uh, you know, what the reading is that it's a September 13th um, cutoff. There is a quirky thing that says, you know, if you entered into a transaction prior to that date, but you know the 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 you know the closing or the finalization of it is after the date. You might still get the lower. Uh, so I don't know what that exactly means. Maybe like if you were selling a rental property, and you know, signed contract. You signed the contract for thirty days. Yeah, you signed the contract before September thirteenth, but you don't close until thereafter. You might still get the lower tax rate. So that's when you know we'll, we'll kind of see how it turns out. Now there's also going to be they're talking about. Uh, a good decent number of retirement account changes uh, in the in the new proposal. I think one of the biggest ones that kind of jumped out to us is that uh, with respect to backdoor Roth IRA. So that's kind of one of our favorite strategies. Um, it allows kind of higher income investors who can't contribute directly to a Roth IRA. It allows them a way to first put money into a non deductible traditional IRA and then convert it to a Roth IRA after that. Uh, and then, you know, get some money into the Roth doing it that way. You can use it to invest in real estate, have it grow tax-free permanently. Um, now, the new proposal is to limit this for wealthy people, which would be a big bummer. And, you know, obviously you guessed it. It's wealthy would be, again, those making over $400,000 a single or four fifty dollars as a married couple. Uh, but in the proposal, they're basically talking about taking away the, the backdoor Roth IRA conversion. And, and then they're also looking at taking away the well, what a lot of people refer to as the mega backdoor Roth, where you can put, uh, you have a 401k plan, property sharing plan through your employer, and they allow you to put after-tax contributions in. So not Roth contributions, but after-tax contributions in excess of your usual 19,500 19, every year. They're looking to get rid of that opportunity as well, or at least not allow you, not take away the opportunity to put after-tax contributions, but to take away the ability to convert the after-tax into a Roth, which people can currently do. So I think they're trying to, you know, 30,000 foot level, they're trying to limit how much money grows tax, tax deferred or tax deferred in retirement accounts is essentially yeah. what they're trying to do. One real quick note though, uh, this, for, you know, these, this, for, this change was not, um, you know, retroactive to 2021. So that means it's still a valid strategy that you can consider this year before the end of the year. Okay. So you can still do back, you know, you potentially could still do backdoor Roth, potentially still do the mega backdoor um, as long as it's before December 31st, 2021. But keep an eye on that, obviously, because this, again, these are all proposals. So as they go through the negotiation part of this, a lot of this language can change. And, you know, if we tell you that, hey, this is going to be applicable to 2022 in a month, they say, no, it's going to be applicable to anything that happens after October 31st or something. That, that's a whole nother ball game, right? Yeah. So don't scare people. I'm, I'm trying not to, but. <laughs> All right. Another thing in the proposed changes with respect to retirement accounts that's important for real estate investors is it looks like they are uh, no longer going to allow self-directed IRAs to invest 
uh, as an accredited investor um, in going forward. And so what does that mean for accredited investor that applies mostly to investments in syndications? So think syndications of apartments, mobile home parks, um, those types of deals, they usually require an investor to be accredited. Um, and so it looks like they're, uh, the proposal is to say that IRAs can no longer invest in those types of deals. So this is important for uh, any passive investors uh, who are using retirement account for real estate inside of a syndication, and also important for any of you who are syndicating deals as well. Um, the two good things is it looks like if a taxpayer's IRA is currently in a syndicated deal, that there might be a grace period of about two years for them to get out of those investments. Um, and uh, also, we don't see any language that says this new rule is applicable to 401ks. So potentially a self-directed 401k could still invest in a syndication. But nonetheless, uh, definitely something that we're going to keep a close eye on. So what else is what else is going on? Potential tax changes, uh, corporate tax rates. We do have some uh, tax, you know, some investors that uh, do use corporations not to hold the real estate, but for management companies and other active real estate. Um, so this is kind of what the change will be. It's it's good and bad news actually. So if you kind of just follow the media, it seems to be really bad news. You know, corporate tax rate going from twenty one percent to twenty six and a half percent. So it's like very alarming. But if you look at the details, um, actually, the 26.5% only kicks in with corporations that have income over 5 million. Um, I would venture to guess that's not most of us uh, on, you know, with that, that we're here today. Right? Yeah, and they're and they're actually lowering the entry point, the, the initial tax rate from 21 down to 18 for those people making under those C cores making under four hundred. Yeah, which is actually the majority of what we see investors, oh, yes. right? So yeah. most investors who have C corporations, whether you're flipping there or a management company, uh, typically the income is under four hundred thousand. So even again, even though it seems to be a bad tax change of an increase, but they did give us a little benefit. So it actually becomes beneficial potentially to have a C corp going forward. Okay. Another potential change is uh, the 3.8% net investment income tax that was passed probably 10, 11 years ago, something like that, that currently applies to investment income. So think interest, dividends, capital gains income. Well, the change there is that they want to apply this 3.8% tax uh, for business income as well. Uh, now, right now, the 3.8% tax is a kind of a, I think it's an extra Medicare or Social Security type of tax. So they're just kind of trying to obviously fund the Social Security system. Yeah. So for people in real estate, you know, think, you know, what is business income? Think fix and flip, wholesale, property management, uh, realtor commissions, right? Broker commissions. Um, if you're not in real estate, you know, um, CPAs, doctors, attorneys, <laughs> um, these are all business income. And this, again, applies to wealthy people uh, who make over 400 um, single and 450,000 married. Uh, something just to clarify, this is on top of right. income taxes, right. right? So you might be paying the 39.6% income tax. Um, and then now you're going to pay an additional 38% uh, this net investment 3. tax. 8%, not 38. Oh, 3.8. Sorry, did I say 38? So now we're up to 80% in taxes. Oh, oh I'm, my gosh. Okay, it's already <laughs> confusing enough. I know. I'm sorry to confuse you. So, so 39.6, regular income tax, and, and then 3.8% net investment tax. Probably also paying you know, self-employment or payroll if you have an S-corp, right? That's up to 15%. So now you're at over- You're scaring people. Yeah. Again. I mean, now you're at over you know, almost 60% in taxes, right? So that's, that's, that's why, you know, obviously it's going to be important to look at your overall strategy and your structure to see if maybe using certain legal entities like an S-corp or C-corp we talked about, they, you know, using that in your strategy might be a way to minimize some of your self-employment taxes and other things. Because um, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with a lot of this stuff, obviously. So here's a couple of things that we didn't see in the proposal, which is good news, which is good news. Like because, no news is good news. Right. And that's what you say as a parent, right? If there's no news about your kid, then it must be good news, right? So, yeah, again, this doesn't mean it can't be added later, but uh, as of right now, it seems like it's not on the, on the chopping block. It's not on the list of things that be changed, but 1031 exchanges. I mean, this is great, great news because we were hearing for the last year and a half that they wanted to make some some changes to 1031 exchanges. So, um, so this means you know you can do a 1031 exchange. You're still eligible to do 1031 exchanges. Uh, it doesn't matter how much your income is theoretically. Um, you could 
yeah, didn't see limitations, basically wasn't addressed. Right. So well, the assumption today is 1031 exchange, the strategy remains similar to how it's been in the past. Okay. Uh, the other one that we didn't see change, there was a lot of talk that uh, when, when someone passes away and uh, the, you know, their beneficiaries inherit their property that they don't get a step up basis. Right, which means the, the, the recipient of the property would um, eventually have to pay taxes on all of that built-in appreciation over the decedent's lifetime. Um, so it looks like that was also not in the latest uh, proposal that we're looking at, uh, which is really great, right? Coupled with 1031 exchange, because one of the strategies is to acquire real estate during your lifetime, you know, do cost segregation, write, up as much, write off as much as possible, 1031 exchange into, you know, larger, better properties, and then just pass away, right? <laughs> just and just I, die. <laughs> and then just pass away, but, but holding the real estate. Uh, and then your kids or beneficiaries will get to inherit that. And not that's, have to the, uh, that's a swap until you drop strategy. That's what we call okay, that. Okay, fine. Yes, that's the, that's the more, <laughs> you know, CPA term. But effectively, that's what it is. And so with if the 1031 exchange remains intact and the step-up basis remains intact, that means that strategy uh, is still really great. Um, you know, as far as we can see, right? Yeah, I mean, all jokes aside, it is a very viable long-term wealth building generational strategy for families, uh, you know, with with real estate investments. One real quick note, we didn't put it on the slide, but I just want to mention it. Um, there is part of the proposal do, is cutting our lifetime estate exemption by about half. So right now it's roughly 11 million. The proposal is going to cut it down to about 5 million per person. So, you know, again, not everyone is going to be at that threshold, but nonetheless, something to keep an eye out for going forward in case that were to pass. Um, and the other thing we didn't see, we get a lot of questions about this bonus depreciation. Um, you didn't see anything right now of that going away for 2022. So, you know, again, as of today, no news is good news. Uh, probably something we can continue to rely on uh, for now. Now, keep in mind that um, there's no news about bonus depreciation going away entirely. Now, under the current law, it is set to scale back every year through the end of, I think, 2026. So for 2021, it's it's at 100% still, right? Yeah, next year is also 100%. Yeah, and then it goes so. down by 20% after 2000, 20% per year after 2022. All right. So today we shared sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the good news is it wasn't all bad. There's a little bit of good things. But we just wanted to take a moment and, um, and say, you know, it's, it's not time to panic, right? We're not just yet, but... Um, mainly just so you know kind of what some of these potential changes are. Um, it just means that some of the strategies that are going forward for 2022 um, will you know, likely need to be tweaked. So it's even more important than ever to be proactive um, in what we do with our taxes. Right. And, you know, just with two typical and traditional income tax saving strategies, uh, you know, you heard us mention that 400,000, 450,000 threshold a lot of times. That's still going to be relevant, right? So all the traditional strategies to get your number down below those thresholds are going to be even more important going forward if, if some of these changes take place. So, um, yeah, I think the takeaway is don't panic. It's just uh, put the plan into place, stay proactive, uh, and stay on top of uh, the potential changes. Yeah, and we will, of course, uh, you know, be updating you guys, too, in the next month or two as, you know, some of these get more finalized. So, all right, have a good one. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys.